False Gods by Graham McNeil. I dropped it. <laughs> Howdy y'all, I'm Rissy and I review things. Today I'm reviewing the second book in the Warhammer 40k Horus Heresy series, False Gods by Graham McNeil. This is a book in which a lot of really important stuff happens. Is Graham McNeil's writing up to the task? We shall see. First, a quick word about the racial strife tearing up the United States right now. I spend most of my time getting political on Twitter. I'm gonna leave a link down below in the description box so you can join me there if you want to, but I'm also not afraid to say it here on YouTube. George Floyd was murdered, Breonna Taylor was murdered, thousands and thousands of black people have been murdered by the United States judicial system even after the days of slavery and it is absolutely wrong and the system must be hauled down and replaced with something that doesn't lead to all of this senseless violence towards black people and other marginalized groups. So what I'm asking of you, my fellow whites, reach deep down into your heart and ask yourself, what would someone like John Brown do? What would William Tecumseh Sherman do? Absolutely step up and support real equal rights for all of us to really recognize that black lives absolutely do matter. I'll also leave some links to various resources and charities that you can donate to. This is something that I do very strongly believe in. If you like leftist shit posting and you hate racism, would love to be your friend on Twitter. That said, on to the book review. I'm doing a special Sons of Horus power armor themed eyeshadow look that I'll get into. But first, I must have his face as bare and blasted as the hearts of those who've turned from the divine light of the Emperor. I love my new hair. All right. First things first, though, we got to put it up and out of the way. All right. Whew. So, false gods. Unlike the first book, this one is written by a guy named Graham McNeil, who is not quite as prolific as Dan Abnett, but he has written several different books in the Horus Heresy, at least. And this one is a doozy, because this is the book where Horus's fall to the dark side takes place, which obviously is a big fucking deal since it sets off the whole Horus heresy <laughs> for which the series is named. Part of what I'm judging this book on is how realistic is the fall from grace. On a scale of Anakin Skywalker to 10, because man, Anakin's fall in the prequel movies is basically the stupidest, least realistic thing ever. He's kind of tricked into working for Palpatine, who promises to help Padme not die in childbirth, and then five seconds later he's murdering a room full of kids, excuse me, younglings. <laughs> but ostensibly, that should be the focus of this book, of Horus making his choice, and it needs to definitely be his choice, right? It can't just be trickery, it can't be demon possession, because again, it's not gonna feel real, right? Horus, if Horus had just been, you know, possessed by a chaos entity of some kind, then it wouldn't really be his fault. Which means this wouldn't really be a tragedy. A tragedy requires people to actually make choices. Choices that doom them. And now oftentimes those choices are as a result of their hamartia, or tragic flaw. Yes, I can finally put all of that Aristotle that I studied to good use. We also, in this book, would need to see the spread of corruption throughout Horus's legion, but also, I mean, other legions, too. So all in all, Graham McNeil had a pretty tough row to hoe. I don't know if it's quite as tough as what Dan Abnett had in terms of introducing all of these freaking characters, getting us attached to them, and then setting up the entirety of the heresy. Now I have to talk about French car games and bodily humors. Um, <laughs> yeah, this shit gets really weird. Horus, in his legion, he's always surrounded himself with four of his top legionaries that act as a kind of advisory board to him. And they are called the Mournival. Now, when I heard that name, I'm like, is that the title of an ICP album or something? Because doesn't it sound like Carnival of Morning? It sounds like something Juggalos would be into, but actually it's the name of a winning hand of cards in, I guess, a French card game. And it means four of a kind, specifically. So the 
Horn of All is ostensibly Horus's winning hand. And also, going back to the theme in my previous video of human culture having gone through what they call Old Night before the Emperor conquered the whole of the Earth and began the Great Crusade, so much learning was just straight up lost. There's a lot of knowledge from, I guess, what you would consider Old Earth, Old Terra, that is just gone. And part of that knowledge is the idea that um, the old Greek concept of the four bodily humors is not accurate. I learned about this when I was training to work at the Renaissance Festival. Huzzah! I have never stopped finding it funny. So, bodily humors. Back in the day, the Greeks and the Romans and eventually medieval Europeans believed that everyone had certain bodily humors that are responsible for your emotions, amongst other things, and if they get out of balance, then bad things will happen to you. That is why primitive physicians were always bleeding people, because you have to drain off the bad bodily humors. And there are four of them. Blood, green bile, phlegm, and black bile. <laughs> it always sounds like a roster of rejected lucky charms. Green clovers, blue boons, and black bile. The corresponding emotions. So if you have a predominance of blood in your overall psychological makeup, that means you're naturally happy and upbeat and horny and generally cheerful. That's where the term sanguine comes from. You're always like excited about shit and you're the life of the party. You're a lot of fun to be around, but you can also be reckless, kind of unthinking, rash and easy to manipulate. Then you have green bile or choler. Yes, this is where the term choleric comes from, meaning somebody who is easily irritated, somebody who's choleric is always fucking angry, spoiling for a fight, and generally a big old pill. On the plus side, they're usually pretty good to have on your side in a fight because they like fighting. Phlegm is the humor of being like super easy going, which I don't get because <laughs> um, every time I have an excess of phlegm, it's not relaxing at all because I'm trying to expel it from my fucking lungs, but whatever. So phlegm is the easygoing humor. It means you're not prone to highs or lows of emotion. It can also be associated with things like laziness and sloth. Finally, you have black bile, the Latin for which is literally melancholia, and that's where we get the term melancholy. So black bile is the humor of being depressed all the time and moody, introspective, introverted. Somebody who with an excess of black bile, yeah, they might be kind of mopey, but they do a lot of thinking about things. Those are the four bodily humors, and those are what is supposed to be represented in each member of the Mornival. Each one is supposed to correspond to one of the bodily humors. Which, hey, that totally makes sense for how to run an army, right? <laughs> like, um, pick representatives of the four completely made up nonsensical bodily humors. By the way, the only time you have black bile in your body is when you have an upper GI bleed, so it's not a thing that naturally should exist inside you. If it does, you have very serious fucking problems. But, you know, that's the Greeks for you. What astounds me is just how long in human history the theory of bodily humors persisted. Like, this shit was, like, up into the 1700s. And apparently in the world of Warhammer all the way into the 31st millennium. So Horus has got his Mornival, and Garviel Loken, who was our protagonist from the first book, who's kind of naive, he's perceived to be a super fucking boy scout, but he's also phlegmatic, meaning he He's generally pretty easygoing, and it's really difficult for him to, like, to get him super riled up. This leads to a lot of discussion amongst the various space marines being like, sheathe your collar, brother, we have no need of it, which I love. Bodily humors are very silly, but I think their inclusion in these books does such a great job of showing, like, yeah, we may live in the 31st millennium, and there's all this amazing new technology, but in some ways, we're still a very primitive species of monkey people who believe in shit like bodily humors. This has been a very long digression, but it's kind of necessary a to explain part of the mindset of the Space Marines, but also we need to talk about the main characters of these stories. Last time I discussed the Remembrancers and Garvia Loken, but there's three other very important Space Marines in the Sons of Horus, and they are also part of the Mournival. So Garvi was the newest addition when a man named Haster Sejanus, who is also really fucking important even though he is never physically present in any of the books, he was Horus's best buddy. He was also, according to Garvi, the most beautiful man to ever exist, and 
had a perfect balance of all four bodily humors. So he must have been a pretty cool dude, although with a name like Haster Sejanus, you would assume that he was evil as balls, but whatever. Horace was extremely distressed by his death, this is important for later. So Garvey has got the burden of not just being a newcomer to the Morn of All, but having to replace somebody that Horace really and truly loved. Not just as one of his soldiers, one of his large adult sons, but also just on a man-to-man -man level. The other members of the Morn of All are super, super important, and one of them still exists in the 41st millennium, and his name is Ezekiel Abaddon. For those of you who don't know, Abaddon as a name is a reference to a demon. The word is Hebrew, it's ancient Hebrew, and it means doom or destruction. Somebody with a name like Abaddon, probably not a great guy. This is one of those instances where things have to be retro-engineered. So in the 41st millennium, Abaddon the Despoiler is the leader of the Black Legion, which is what the Sons of Horus eventually become. And he's the closest thing that the Space Marines of Chaos have to a proper leader. He's famous for leading what are called Black Crusades, where he and his forces come out of the Eye of Terror, they live in the warp, they come out and they just friggin' lay waste to the Empire until they get driven off. But then they come back. There have been 13 Black Crusades. Obviously, the name Abaddon is a great name for a bad guy in the 41st millennium, which is what he was created for. However, in the prequel, we have to at least pretend like he's not completely and totally fucking evil. So, um, <laughs> so great. The way Games Workshop seems to have settled on to try and make it seem that Abaddon is just a totally normal name for a totally normal dude is by giving a bunch of the rest of the Sons of Horus names that rhyme with Abaddon. So there's a Torgaddon. Let me get the book. It's too fucking good. Um, <laughs> there's a Torgaddon. There's an Eckhaden. Yeah, there's like five different dudes who have names that rhyme with Abaddon. And it's like, oh, this is just, you know, a cute baby naming trend from the 31st millennium. All the girls were named Brittany or Alexis, and all the boys are named things that instead of rhyming with Jaden, they rhyme with Abaddon. <laughs> Like, okay, Games Workshop, well, at least you fucking tried. There's that. Ezekiel Abaddon is the captain of the first company of the Sons of Horus, and he is a gigantic fucking badass. He's also the choleric one, so he's always Mr. Fucking Cranky Pants, always wants to fight. He also has a big stupid top knot that he wears his hair in. Top knots can be really cool. The problem is all the art associated with the Baden from Games Workshop, it's like a foot tall on top of his head, and it looks really, really dumb. So it's kind of hard to take him seriously as this, oh, the destroyer of men. Ha ha ha, he just boils all, but he looks really shitty. Filling out the Mournivals, there's a guy named Tariq Torgaddon, who's Garviel Loken's best friend, and he's the sanguine one. He's got a really well-developed sense of humor, he loves jokes, always ready for action, but not in a grumpy, mean way, in like a ha-ha, on to high adventure kind of way. So he is super sanguine. He's always teasing Garvey about having kind of a stick up his ass about his morals, or they call him a starch arse. And don't put starch in your butthole, you guys. That's not great for you. And finally, there is Horus Aximand. Back in the days of the Luna Wolves, there were a number of space marines of that chapter that ended up looking a lot like Horus, which means like really big and bald. Horus is supposed to be really beautiful, but his armor makes him look kind of like an egg. It goes up and over his head and he's completely bald. He also looks kind of weirdly aged compared to the other Primarchs, so I don't know, maybe I'm missing something. Many of these space marines looked a lot like Horus, and so they were informally referred to as the Sons of Horus, which hence the name of the whole legion later on. Horus Aximand definitely falls into the phenotype of being a Son of Horus, and so he's generally referred to as Little Horus, and he's the melancholic one, and it really shows in the books. He's very quiet. He mostly just goes along with whatever Abaddon is doing, but sometimes he voices an opinion, and he and Garvey are actually kind of close. His character development is pretty interesting. So that's our Mournival. At the beginning of the book, everything is pretty great. Garvey is finally starting to fit in. Horace takes his advice pretty seriously. Even Abaddon seems to be kind of coming around to him. The only fly in the ointment at this point is the character of Erebus. 
And Erebus, as I learned from getting onto the 40k lore subreddit, which I highly recommend, generally anytime somebody mentions Erebus, it's usually in the context of fuck Erebus, fuck that guy. He also exists in the 41st millennium and he's not a good dude. So he's not actually part of the Sons of Horus. He is a member of the Word Bearers. The Word Bearers are another legion, and I mentioned them last time, and they were the first ones to fall to chaos. Of course, they did it in secret. This was a direct consequence of the Emperor being a giant fucking dickbag. <laughs> the Primarch of the Word Bearers, Lorgar, believed that the Emperor was divine and should be worshipped accordingly. The Emperor really does not like this, so when he thought that Lorgar's sort of worship and building temples to the Emperor on all the planets that he was supposed to be conquering was getting in the way of the Great Crusade, he had the whole legion censured and fucking humiliated. Instead of just being like, yo son, I need you to tone that shit down, he made Lorgar feel so fucking bad that he ended up finding new objects of worship, and that of course was the gods of chaos. Now he was led to this by Erebus, his right-hand man, who had always secretly been a chaos worshipper. I'm really fucking glad they never tried to pretend like Erebus was a good guy so that they were gonna give a lot of people names that rhymed with Erebus. So Lorgar sends Erebus to go hang out with Horus to convert him to the way of chaos. Erebus is an extremely charismatic guy and really tries to get along with people. The only one who kind of sees through him is Garvey, and Garvey just does not like Erebus. Of course, nobody else fucking notices. One of the things that that happened at the end of the first book was the Sons of Horus encountering a planet full of humans called the Interrex. They seem really fucking cool. Horus gets into negotiations with them. What he wants is to bring them into the Empire, and this is, again, just showing that Horus was a pretty great guy instead of deciding to just fucking storm in and conquer their world. Well, unfortunately, those negotiations fall through in pretty spectacular fashion because somebody from the Spes Marines steals an ancient weapon Weapon that the Interrex had in a museum, and it's this evil knife called an anathame, which is the term for like a ritual dagger used in sacrifices, and that somebody is definitely Erebus. And again, Garvia Loken is the only person who seemed to figure that out. Relations with the Interrex deteriorated pretty quickly, which is really too bad, because the Interrex are some of the only humans that actually knew about chaos and its forms, and could have taught the Imperials ever so much. That's the end of the first book. The anathame has has been stolen, and Erebus definitely stole it. But why? Well, he stole it to kill Horus. Wait, what? Why would Erebus try to kill Horus? Well, he didn't actually try and kill him, per se. What he wanted to do was severely injure Horus as part of a fairly convoluted plot to bring him over to the side of chaos. So obviously none of this would have worked if Horus weren't already consumed with doubt, which we know that he is. At the end of the first book, also, we find out that Horus and his sons are going to a planet called Davin. I've done some research into older lore that predates the novels. This is the Index Astartes, and this is meant to be supplemental material for playing the game. Here it says, Before he could return to Terra to be officially invested with his new title, Horus apparently fell ill on a small feral world called Davin. During his convalescence, he took part in an induction ceremony of a warrior lodge on the planet. This was the Primarch's well-tried practice to develop ties with local populations. Feral natives were more easily recruited into the Imperial fold when the warriors from the stars became their brothers. However, this time was different. In the days that followed, Horus's officers detected a change in his character. It is now presumed that the Warrior Lodge was in fact a Chaos Coven, which somehow managed to ensorcel the War Master. That's what we're working with as the framework for this story. Although, the way it's described, it sounds more like that he's been just, you know, fucking possessed by a demon, that this wasn't his choice at all. In this book, that idea is refuted. What happens is Erebus manages to maneuver the Sons of Horus to go to Davin. There's Davin the planet, and then it has a moon. What Erebus says is that some of the space marines that had been present on Davin when the world was first brought into the Imperial Fold have apparently turned traitor and set up shop on the moon of Davin. Horus and his sons take this as a personal affront and they have to go to the fucking moon and destroy these traitors. One of them was one of Horus's most trusted friends and companions. Some of the writing in this section, called The Plague Moon, is absolutely some of the best. The moon of Davin is overrun by, as it turns out, chaos cultists who worship Nur, 
Jericho, who if you remember from my previous video, is the chaos god of rot, decay, festering, gross shit, always having your entrails on the outside of your body. These space marines go to the moon and are attacked by zombie space marines who are full of gross plagueness. McNeil does a great job when he's describing this stuff. Everyone's bloated limbs and unnaturally extended tongues, flies buzzing around, the horrid explosion of entrails, like he just goes balls to the fucking wall on that and I think he does a great job. On to eyeshadow. I'm really excited and kind of nervous. I am basing this eyeshadow look on official art from the Index Astartes as to what these pre-heresy Sons of Horus looked like. Their primary color is a seafoam green. It's not the easiest color to build an eyeshadow look around but we're gonna do what we can. First I was like what the fuck kind of transition shade can I use and I'm like ah gray. <laughs> gray actually goes really well with seafoam green. So the space marines get bogged down on the plague moon and eventually Horus comes face to face with the guy who had been his friend and they fight and this dude has this crazy weapon that manages to grievously fucking wound Horus can you guess what it might be it's the Anathame oh shit there's this giant fight with this gross Nurglite monster dude who is trying to convince Horus Join us to the dark side! We're really gross! Uh, you too can be really gross! And Horus is like, what the fuck is wrong with you, dude? At the very end, once Horus has successfully defeated this dude and he's about to die, the personality of his old friend resurfaces and tells him, like, the chaos gods are real! Don't join them! Chaos is bad! It will destroy you! But Horus sits there mourning his friend until his injuries overtake him. He straight up collapses, which sends absolutely everyone into a complete and total fucking panic. There's no medical facilities on the moon of Davin, so they take Horus first back to his ship and then it turns out their medical treatments aren't working, that he's dying and nobody can figure out why. Erebus persuades the members of the Mornival, well three members of the Mornival, to take Horus down to Davin and take him to one of these warrior lodges because they have secret ways of healing. Thus the trap is sprung. Now the idea of the warrior lodges was introduced in the first book as a thing for space marines. The idea was that it's these kind of informal societies where regular space marine soldiers and their officers can just mix, hang out, get to know each other, and talk without having to observe chain of command stuff. Garvey is very very suspicious of them because they're secretive and he hates anything that's cloaked in secrecy and assumes that it must be evil. Well he was totally right! And his friends take him to one of the lodge meetings and they're like, see it's totally cool, this is normal, we're just hanging out. Well apparently the inspiration for these warrior lodges was the culture on Davin. Some of the Mornival, especially Abaddon and Aximand, take Horus into this warrior lodge run by an evil shamaness. And of course, it's a chaos lodge. But what happens, instead of Horus being possessed by a demon, they drug him up and they send him into this trance state where he has visions. At first he thinks he's dead. And then the figure of his old best buddy, Haster Sejanus, appears to him to be his vision quest guide. This isn't Haster Sejanus, it's Erebus, who has also projected his consciousness into Horus's dreams. He's there to show Horus certain things that will ostensibly turn him to the side of chaos. And what Horus sees, again this is one of the better written parts of the book, these horrifying visions of the future, a future in which the Emperor is worshipped as a god. What Horus sees is the 41st millennium, where everything has gone to absolute shit, the Empire is falling apart, everybody is a theocratic space Nazi, and the Emperor is worshipped. He is of course aghast. What Erebus doesn't show him is that the Emperor is also a rotting corpse sitting on the throne. Erebus is able to convince Horus that the Emperor's entire deal was making the Primarchs with the express intention of destroying them as soon as they had served their purpose and that what the Emperor really wanted all along was to elevate himself to godhood, completely betraying the ideals that he had claimed to have. Horus is not fucking pleased by this. It does a great job of playing off of his insecurities, that the Emperor never really loved him, he's been used, and the Emperor is really just gonna betray them as soon as he gets the chance. 
Also intruding into Horace's dreams is his brother Magnus, one of the Primarchs. Now Magnus, aka Magnus the Red, aka the Cyclops, because he's either missing an eye or he just has one eye. It's never really settled. Magnus is a really powerful sorcerer and he sensed what was happening on Davin and shows up to try and be like, Horace, Horace, hey bro, this shit is evil. Do not get involved. These people are assholes and they want to turn you to the forces of chaos. And also that's not Haster Sejanus. And Erebus is like, yeah, I just kind of took on this dude's form so it would be more comfortable for you. And here's the thing that gets me is that Horace does not fucking flip his shit about this. He's like, yeah, I already knew. I'm like, did you though? Did you, Horace? And it's just very strange to me that he doesn't just immediately stomp a fucking mud hole in Erebus for daring to take on the shape of his lost friend. So that's strike number one. And then Horace just gets really, really angry at Magnus for presuming to show up in his vision quest. Horace and Magnus have a giant blowout. At the very end of it, Horace yells at both of them and he's like, I have made my choice, now get out of my sight. And we don't know what that choice is, but of course we totally know what that choice is. Horace has fallen to the dark side. This section, it doesn't work. It really doesn't work all that well. Because of the setup that we had in the first book, it's not impossible to believe. But at the same time, this section needed to be so much stronger. It also needed to be a lot longer. Horace is smart. He's not a fucking idiot. So why didn't he demand some kind of proof from his spirit guide, even when he thought it was Haster Sejanus? Why didn't he demand some kind of proof that these visions were accurate? He had literally just spent some time getting a lecture from one of his former most trusted legionaries that the forces of chaos are evil and deceptive. <laughs> they will do horrible things to you if you sign up with them. I'm surprised that Horace wasn't more skeptical about what he was being shown. Now, it would have been easy enough for Erebus to show him things that would prove what he was saying was accurate, but we don't get anything like that. Horus is remarkably easy to deceive for no apparent reason. In this vision, his mental processes don't seem to have been impeded at all, so why does he fall for it so easily? I don't know. And I think that's a real failing of this book, unfortunately. I was pretty fucking annoyed by that. It is a strength of this book that they didn't just have him possessed by a demon. This is actually a choice that he made, even though his reasons for making it are kind of inexplicable, or at least not nearly as explicable as they should have been. Once Horus comes out of his trance and he's completely healed of the evil effects of the Anathame, he immediately starts instituting the evil or more chaos related parts of the Warrior Lodge into the everyday. And from that point in the book, it's mostly from Garvey's perspective, seeing that there's all these new weird battle standards that his fellow legionaries are waving around that reference an eight-pointed star, the symbol of chaos. There's a lot more talk of the eightfold path. This is where I think that there really should have been more setup for this in the first book, because the lodges are supposed to come from a tainted source and patterned off of it, there should have been at least subtle hints that people, again, who are familiar with the game and with some of the lore, maybe the space marines don't understand the root of some of the ritual secrecy they have surrounding the lodges, but you could have references to like, oh yes, we we follow the Eightfold Path, they don't know what it means, but they just say it. But we don't get any of that in the first book, and none of it in the second book until after Horus has already become evil. But the lodges were supposed to be a source of evil all along, and a lot of the people in various other legions running the warrior lodges were also devotees of chaos from day one, and I'm like, okay, we needed way more setup. That is the main problem with this book, is certain things go on way too fucking long, and other things don't get nearly as much screen time as they should. Horace's decision to side with chaos, despite having just gotten a lengthy lecture from his horrifyingly mutilated friend about the evils of chaos, kind of comes out of nowhere. There's enough buildup, and we know enough about what he's going through mentally that it's not a complete fail, but it comes close. By the end of the book, Garvey has been completely frozen out of the Mornival and Torgadon as well, since he and Garvey are best friends, and Horace rightly perceived that Garvey would never go along with his brand new plan. Horace has decided the Emperor must be overthrown so that he cannot ascend to godhood over the corpses of the Space Marines and his fellow Primarchs. And at the very end of the book, 
Horus is ostensibly converted one of his brothers, Fulgrim, to whom he gives the Anathame. It's a sign that the Emperor's Children Legion is also falling to chaos. That is detailed in the events of the fifth book, Fulgrim, which we'll definitely talk about later. So everything is just falling to shit, but of course, Garvey kind of suspects, but he does not know. Everything just seems wrong to him, and I will say we get a great sense of his loneliness, that feeling where everything is changed, but you don't know why, and you don't know how it happened, and suddenly everything good is now shitty. Erebus and Abaddon are effectively the Mournival with Horus Aximend kind of sort of hanging out too. Part of the problem is that McNeil's prose is just not nearly as good as Abnett. He can write decently well, he just can't hold on to it. His best writing is always when he's describing scenes of horror. Actually, he would probably make a really amazing horror writer when he's describing the shit on the plague moon. It's really cool and really fucking gross. I love it. But when he's trying to talk about human emotions, he's not really good, although lines like Garvey Loken felt every humor in his body come out of balance. I'm like, okay, that's pretty great. But in terms of genuine human feelings that you as a reader can take seriously, that is not really Graham McNeil's strong suit. He also, well, okay, so there's a, there's another weird, weird thing in this book that I haven't even gotten to touch on yet. And that's the character of Petronella Vivar. Oh boy. So she is a Remembrancer, and much like the last book, this one opens up with the introduction of a Remembrancer. On one hand, I'm like, another one? We really fucking need that? I guess we did. Petronella Vivar, unlike our other Remembrancers, Mercedes Oliton, Ignace Carcasey, and Euphrati Keeler, she is a scion of a very wealthy family of nobles. She is a mean girl stereotype for the 31st millennium, I guess. She's just a monstrous bitch to everybody. She has servants that she horribly abuses. She's apparently a documentarist. Written histories is her thing. She is showing up to be Horace's specific remembrancer. This is kind of a problem. We've already got a bunch of remembrancer characters. This one does not have any special abilities aside from all the plastic surgery she's apparently fucking had. She's always dressing as skankily as possible, and her outfits are described in great detail, which I normally don't mind, but none of the space marines are into her, and neither is Horace. Although there's some indication that she might kind of have sex feelings for him, she's not really capable of feelings feelings. This is illustrated by the way in which she treats her bodyguard, a dude named Maggard, which, uh, who is a slave. He was captured by her family, they had his vocal cords surgically removed, and he is a highly trained killer. Also, she makes him have sex with her. She's a rapist. Any chance of her being a genuinely sympathetic remembrance her characters when right out the fucking window. She has this device that allows Maggard's thoughts to be written down on a tablet, and he calls her a bitch, a fucking bitch, in his mind. Which is the first time I'd seen anything like that in Warhammer. Unlike a lot of other grimdark works, Warhammer does not depend on humiliation and degradation of women to make its points about grimdark, which has been a refreshing change. Until... Petronella. Petronella shows up, she takes up a lot of Horace's time, she does really stupid shitty things that put a lot of people in danger. She demands to go down and witness the fighting on the plague moon, so she just independently takes her ship and fucks everything up. She gets a drunken confession out of Horace as to all of his insecurities. Apparently, he gives her all this information about the inner workings of his heart, but McNeil doesn't actually deliver on any of what that entails. Then at the very end of things, after Horace is finally gone, evil, he shows up in her chambers and demands to read what she's been writing, and he's like, oh, it's too bad that no one will see this, and then just breaks her neck. And I'm like, was there a point to this fucking character? She's dead, but it's not like, Horace has gone too far. He killed our beloved favorite Petronella Vivar, the rich bitch rapist. Oh no. No one cur. The world is genuinely better off without her. So now we've got Maggard just floating around at loose ends, and he becomes a toady for Malagurst the Twisted, who I do not have time to get into that shit, but Malagurst is basically Horace's evil aide-de-camp. He recruits Maggard to do a bunch of dirty business, like assassinating one of the other Remembrancers who's stirring up trouble. Yeah, Maggard is a badass, but he's not a space marine. Anything that Maggard was doing could be done by a space marine, and it would be more likely that Malagurst would recruit another space marine to be 
assisting with his fucking dirty work. It doesn't make any sense. There's no reason for these characters to be here. That is a bunch of screen time that could have been given to Horace's vision quest of evil. So I'm kind of peeved about that and also just how badly written Petronella is. She's just such a collection of mean girl stereotypes. I genuinely don't get the point of her or really the point of Maggard. He actually survives into the third book, so more on him later. The Index of Startes shows the Sons of Horus pre-heresy had an armor base of seafoam green with what looked like a very, very dark blue trim. And obviously, based on the symbol of the Sons of Horus, there's no way that I could do a look inspired by them without adding a fairly thick wing. I don't usually use winged liner. I did manage to find one in a very dark navy, so I'm gonna go off screen and apply this because I don't think I can do it while talking. I'm a little bit terrified, but we shall see. And we're back. These wings are about as even as I can possibly get them, so I'm just gonna leave them as is so I don't screw everything up. Okay, where was I? Oh yeah, Petronella and Mag. So they are part of a symptom of McNeil's writing where he introduces so much extraneous crap and doesn't focus nearly enough on the really, really important stuff. The other primary example of this is the, I don't know, Docking Bay Massacre? I'm not entirely sure what to call it. When Horace is first wounded, the members of the Mornival surround his body and take it to his spaceship so that they can get him into the medical bay. Unfortunately, because everyone has lost their goddamn minds because this amazing Primarch is injured and he might die, nobody knows what to do. All of these people have shown up at the docking bay to try and find out what's going on, and it's mostly humans, some civilians included. It's important to remember there are a shit ton of Remembrancers aboard Horus's ship. Everybody gets clustered into the docking bay to try and see Horus and the Mornival. They're all trying to drag his body to the medical bay, and there's this huge fucking crowd of hundreds of people. The Mornival shoves some of them out of the way. This apparently gets some people killed. Killed. This causes huge problems for Horace's Legion because video footage of this and descriptions of it from Remembrancers gets back to Earth and the High Lords of Terra are like, you guys need to be more careful of human lives. What the fuck did you do? This scene makes no fucking sense at all. It needed to make a lot of sense because it's a big goddamn deal. We're expected to believe that Garvia Logan, our dude who cares so much for human life, he goes out of his way to protect remembrancers and just people in general, that first of all, that he'd be participating in this, and second, where did all of these people get into the docking bay? Isn't this a restricted area? I, I can get space marines, if you shove a normal human hard enough, then yeah, if they bump up against a wall or something or hit their head, maybe they die. Okay. But it seems like in this instance, why wouldn't Garvey have used less force and just crowds of people so the Space Marines are just going to be shoving them aside. They would be pushing them into other human squishy bodies. What I could see is a bunch of people getting trampled underfoot, especially of each other. But the idea that all of our Mournival members are just callously killing hundreds of humans. I'm like, what? It makes no sense. And it's also over in like two seconds. It takes a page and a half to get through this and we don't see it through Garviel Loken's point of view. Since he's the most conscientious and humane of any of the space marines that we've really encountered, we absolutely need to see his perspective on this. Was he just consumed with rage and terror because his Primarch has fallen? What was going on? The one thing we do get out of it is one of the Remembrancers, Ignis Carcasey, who's a poet, starts his own newspaper documenting all of the abuses of space marines towards civilians and Garvey's like, at first, what the fuck are you doing, man? And then Carcasey talks him around and Garvey's like, I insist that the truth be told at all times, so I guess you can go ahead and keep publishing this thing. Garvey Loken, defender of our First Amendment rights. The other major plot thread in this book is is the rise of what's gonna become the cult of the Divine Emperor. We were kind of introduced to this in the first book, that there's this thing called the Lectitio Divinitatis, and it's a cult that's gaining popularity, even though the Emperor is like, no, I'm not a god, you're not allowed to worship me, I'm more than a man, but I come from man, so that's a big old fucking no-no. One of the things driving this is the appearance of the world's first living saint, and that is Euphrati Keeler, the Remembrancer. In the first book, she is one of the only humans that encounters a chaos-possessed marine in a genuinely spooky 
part of the book. She goes through a real rough time as a result because, of course, there's no proper explanation for what happened. The Emperor has kept a lot of the Space Marines and the Primarchs in the dark as to the exact nature of the malign intelligences living in the warp that can come through and possess people. So imagine humans. They've been taught that there's no such thing as supernatural beings. And then poor Euphrati Keeler, she's seen things that no human was meant to see and that even Space Marines have a tough time dealing with. Obviously, this is not good for her mental health. She falls, first of all, into a pretty deep depression, and then as she's starting to come out of it, she gets involved in the cult of the Emperor because she believes, she's like, the Emperor will protect us from this kind of thing. The Emperor alone can stand between us regular folk and these horrifying demons. At one point in the book, Carol Sinderman, who is Garviel Loken's old mentor, gets his hands on a book written by Lorgar, who, keep in mind, is the first Primarch to fall to chaos, and he's trying to translate it, and the act of doing so summons a fucking chaos demon. He's there with Euphrati Keeler and her concentrated faith drives the demon away. And everyone's like, what? And then she falls into a coma. From that point on, people start referring to her as a saint. That's how the book ends. She's in a coma. People are starting to request to be near her once the story of what she did starts traveling around. The other major plot thread is we're seeing the other legions start to fall to chaos. Fulgrim has been corrupted, but also as a result of confronting Horus, in his visions, Magnus tries to contact the Emperor and be like, Ayo, Dad, your favorite son has fallen prey to the forces of chaos. You need to be on the alert for that shit. Unfortunately, it's really difficult at that time to establish psychic communication, so Magnus has to rely on fell sorcery, i.e. warp powers, to get his message through. And what ends up happening is he inadvertently destroys the Emperor's creation of something called the Webway, which is the top secret project he'd gone back to Earth to work on, and it's supposed to be a method of transport for human spaceships that doesn't require traveling through the warp, which would be awesome. Magnus's psychic strength is so great that it just punches right through it and all these fucking demons flood in. The Emperor is pretty fucking pissed as a result. This leads leads to him passing censure on Magnus and sending the Space Wolves to Magnus's planet of Prospero to go round him up. This causes Magnus to defect to the side of Chaos. So that is a big fucking deal right there. And then at the very end of the book, we find out Horus is going to start launching his master plan, and that involves going to a planet called Istvan Three. The planets Istvan Three and Istvan Five are already well known in the lore as sites of horrifying massacres. We know that shit is about to get real as of the end of the second book. What are my overall feelings on it? Well, there's some big problems. McNeil does a lot of things right. Anytime he's writing about over-the-top gross chaos shit, anytime something scary is happening, he does a pretty damn good job of writing it. The problem is, is that the book isn't just about fighting zombie space marines on the plague moon of Davin. I think McNeil would have had a better career as um, a writer of Lovecraftian-style horror. I've discussed the character of Petronella Vivar and Maggard. I don't think they belong. The Docking Bay Massacre needed to either be a lot longer or should just have been cut out entirely. I think Horace's decisions don't come across as very well-reasoned. Definitely not as good a book as the first one, unfortunately. I hope that future books by McNeil will play more to his strengths. So here's the final look. Considering that green eyeshadow is not the easiest to wear, and these wings were very difficult to draw on with that eyeliner, I'm pretty freaking happy with it. I wish I were as happy with the book as I am with my eyeliner. <laughs> Obviously, this was not enough to ruin the series, as I kept on obsessively reading, and am still doing so. I mean, I have enough headcanon built up that I can actually kind of paper over what I consider to be the flaws in the writing and make Horace's decisions sort of make sense for me. The third book is called Galaxy in Flames. I wonder what's gonna happen in that one. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be lots of peaceful tea times. Don't worry, my fellow 40k fans, I still freaking love the lore, I still love the series thus far, it's just a few stumbles here and there, and to be fair, this is pretty difficult stuff to write. You have to have a sympathy for the devil thing going on, but you also have to show that he is the devil. Not the easiest thing to write, I just wish they'd given this book to Abnett, 
or somebody with better writing chops than Graham McNeil. Although who knows, maybe this was just a one-off and McNeil is actually a much better writer than I give him credit for. We will see because of course there are a ton more Horace Heresy reviews and appropriate eyeshadow looks to come. So until next time, keep all of your bodily humors in balance, y'all. Don't get too choleric. <laughs>